dreadful um, as this virus is to um, to the world, um, it has created some very, very unique possibilities and opportunities in terms of technology um, for music. Welcome to The Choir Baton, a podcast designed to engage with people and stories, ideas, and inspirations stemming from choir. No other art form, no sport, no hobby, no business requires a group of people to execute a communal goal with just their voices. Join me, your host, Beth Philemon, as I interview guests who are singers, teacher conductors, instrumentalists, and community members. Together, we'll ask questions, seek understanding, and share insight from our experiences in life and in choir. Choir Baton listeners, thank you for joining me for another episode of the Choir Baton podcast. I am really excited to have Dr. Dennis Schrock as our guest today. Welcome, Dr. Schrock. Thank you. Glad to be um, with you doing this. Absolutely. So if you know the name of uh, Dr. Schrock, it is probably from one of his eight books um, that he has self-published, three with Oxford, five with GIA. Uh, in addition to his co-authors, he's done, co-authorship he's done with other people as an editor, in addition to faculty positions that he's held, so many awards, recognitions, uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I just, again, I'm really excited that you're joining us today. Oh, thank you so much. If you could see me, you'd see that I was blushing. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Well, Dr. Schrock, you are the leading expert in choral repertoire and just, I think, the history of choral music. And I was really excited to talk with you today about innovation in choir. I think particularly with what we're experiencing around the world as choir rehearsals as we've known them for thousands of years are not existing, um, we are having to innovate within our field. And I just wanted all of your thoughts about where we've, where we've come from and maybe your thoughts on where we are going to go too. Yeah, sure. And I very much would like to talk about the actual choir experience. But um, given my uh, history as an author, uh, I'd like to talk about that uh, first yeah. and, and the influences of technology. So when I wrote my first book, um, the Choral Repertoire book with Oxford University Press, it was 11 years ago. Hmm. Um, and um, I needed libraries. Mm-hmm. I began it when I was at the University of Oklahoma, and fortunately, they would buy any primary source I wanted them to buy. Wow. Um, and they even put it in a little room, and I had the unusual um, benefit of being given a key to the library so I could go in on weekends and or Sundays and holidays and so forth and work. <laughs> it's one of my prized possessions during that time. Um, but then I, I moved and <clears throat> I spent time in Santa Fe when I was um, artistic director of the Santa Fe Desert Corral. Um, and the University of New Mexico was also very helpful. Then in the final stages of writing uh, the book, I was at Yale. And of course, Yale has one, Yale School of Music has one of the great music libraries. Right. Um, so I, I was fortunate in, with all of that. Um, not later now, for instance, my most recent book, which is with GIA, um, and it's performing Renaissance music. Mm-hmm. I have no need for libraries at all. Wow. Because all of the material exists online. So for instance, this is, you know, unusual, um, in, One of the chapters of performing Renaissance music is on ornamentation, a little um, basically unknown ornamentation during the Renaissance era. Most people think it's Baroque, but it was a large performance practice area during the Renaissance era. Um, And so I, I, I identified 10 primary source treatises during mostly the 16th century um, that dealt with the topic of ornamentation, dealt exclusively almost with the topic of um, ornamentation, identified them. Every single one of them 
in its original form exists on IMSLP. Wow. Yep, so I could not only work with translations, but I had the originals that I could download, extract images, and then um, put them actually in the book. So that source, and if your readers, uh, listeners, are not familiar with the Petrucci Library, Mm -hmm. which is called IMSLP, then they should become aware of it because it's um, a great source of um, choral music. Absolutely. Well, Just yeah, inter- of, sorry, go ahead. Uh, instrumental music as well. Right. You know, I, I have been on IMSLP numerous times, particularly during my graduate study and in choral literature, for which we used your book uh, that you spoke of. And I'm, I'm curious, when you are going through that, because it is so massive, there is so much to it, what are ways in which you discern quality? Well, that's really fascinating because I am right now um, writing another book, my uh, my newest, newest one, and it is entitled Creating Excellence mm. in Choirs and Orchestras. So I am um, specifically targeting the aspect of quality in repertoire and in performance. Right. Wow. So how, how, how does that come about? Well, from a lot of different sources. You know, one can't be... The more sources one has at one's disposal, the more objective one can be. So, for instance, um, if um, 10 sources say the same thing, one can pretty much assume that there's relative accuracy sure. in what is being said. Um, and if... Um, Um, a a number of historical sources over the years say that the Beethoven Misa Solemnis or the Bach B minor Mass or the St. Matthew Passion or the Palestrina Misa Pape Marcelli um, are masterworks, then one can assume, well, I guess they are masterworks. Mm -hmm. And that I can therefore recommend them in the book for up-and-coming students of choral repertoire these are the works you should probably get to know. Right. Right. Does that help you? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that is brings about another interesting point though too that people especially myself included struggle with and that is the fact that it is a time staking process right it's not we're so used to this my, well what I used to call microwave society you know things happen so quickly now they happen even faster um, right. and and that it really is engaging in this process and um, taking the time to to dig deep true um, so I've uh, been very fortunate not only in the length of my professional career, because I started teaching at Westminster Choir College when I was in my 20s, Mm. Um, but then in having the experiences with such a variety of repertoire, those choral orchestral works, when I was a student there, um, as as a student, I got to perform the Mahler Symphony Number no. Two and Number no. Eight with Bernstein in the New York Philharmonic, wow. the Beethoven Ninth with Herbert von Karajan in the Berlin Philharmonic, and also with Leopold Stokowski um, and um, the Verdi Requiem with Eugene Ormandy. I had yeah. these experiences when I was an undergrad student, yeah. and then it just went on from there. And yeah. then teaching graduate students, you know, I had to be. We were, we were just always performing the Bach cantatas and the Mozart masses and Haydn masses. And then I went to Santa Fe and had no previous experience with all of the um, virtuosic a cappella choral mm-hmm. repertoire from around the world. But I certainly gained that because I needed to. It was part of uh, my responsibilities as artistic director of that ensemble. So over the years, I was able to be connected with these various aspects or genres of choral music Mm -hmm. and therefore get to know them. Right. Now, I'm curious, um, at Westminster, did you already have in mind a career in academia or were some of those influences that you had, those performances that you were a part of, were those also driving factors to pursue the career that you have? 
No, I did. I did not have the dream of um, being an academician um, or a conductor. Really, I was there. I was there because I was attracted to music, and through various circumstances, I knew that I was not going to be an architect, which is what I thought I wanted to be. Hmm. Um, but there was this music. It was the faculty um, and other people who said this is what you need to do this is where you should go and i had trust and and faith in them there was one uh, particularly um, critical and an important um, event um, or circumstance um, that really set me on my path um, a, a great choral conductor by the name of howard swan mm-hmm. he's not very well known these days <clears throat> um, because he was the predecessor and basic teacher of people like Robert Shaw and Roger Wagner. Right. Um, in any event, he was at Westminster for a, a session um, um, of five days, intercession, you know, talking about the history of choral music in America. Mm. Um, you know, and the schools of St. Olaf with the, Ms. Christiansen and mm. Westminster, et cetera, and so forth. Um, and I helped him. I, I was there making sure he had all the materials he needed. And we had breakfast and lunch and dinner and drinks together. And just, you know, it was wonderful. I got to spend these five days with him. Mm-hmm. And at the very end of it, he said, Dennis, I think I've gotten to know you. Mm-hmm. There are scholars and there are conductors. You be both. Wow. Yep. That's what he said. And I didn't, I didn't exactly comprehend it then, but I certainly do now. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have chills even just thinking about the magnitude, first of anyone saying that to someone, especially a young student as you were at that time, but then someone of the magnitude of Howard Swan as well saying that is amazing. Yeah, yeah it was amazing. Um, yeah. And I am, of course, very, very grateful. Right. And and when it when it came to um, the writing of the choral repertoire book, um, I wanted to help people um, find their way through this mass of repertoire, mm-hmm. um, and to be of some help to students in f- in finding their way through all of this, and also to conductors who would be programming and who say, for instance, wanted to do a Handel oratorio um, other than Messiah. Right. So, you know, what are they and what are they about, et cetera, and so forth. And so I was fortunate, um, again, with circumstance, in when I was in Santa Fe, um, one of the members of the board of the Desert Corral, Don Lamb, had been president and CEO of Norton and Norton. Hmm. He was basically retired living in Santa Fe, but he was a big corral supporter. Um, and we got together and, and he said, Dennis, you need to, you need to write this book <laughs> and here's what you're going to do. Um, and you're going to submit it to Oxford. I, I didn't know anything from anything. Um, but I followed his lead and submitted it. And then again, <laughs> of being fortunate, um, I immediately, um, had communication with Suzanne Ryan, um, who was then editor of music books mm. for Oxford University Press. She then went on to become editor in chief of humanities. Um, so I was du- dealing directly with her, and um, together we came up with the format of uh, choral repertoire and that. Um, it could, in fact, be written. I mean, because there was, you know, the um, question of whether anybody could write such a book, such as this, yeah. um, eleven years ago, or, of course, more than eleven years ago. Um, right. How long was that process? Well, it was a couple of years, um, and that's another funny story. Um, Book contracts are usually for numbers of words, mm-hmm. I mean, as they are for oh. papers in colleges and universities, too. 
Um, and so Suzanne came up with um, 400,000 words. So your book will be 400,000 words um, and no more. Dennis, hear this. No more than 400,000 <laughs> words. Um, so, okay, fine. And I, I'm in the process of writing. And one day I think, oh, well, what does that mean, actually? Mm. What is what is what does that translate to um, when I'm sitting down writing every day? Well, you know, that's a thousand words a day every day for two years. I mean, or wow. you know, given that you have to proof and you have to research, um, you know, it's not just um, tabulating a thousand words a day. Right. Um, so there you go. That's it's unbelievable. And how, so, how many words did it end up being? Four hundred thousand. Wow. Wow. No, actually, it was it it was three hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred and something. Really, it was that. Um, but I don't care. I mean, Suzanne won't care to know this by now. But there's a very curious um, procedure with Oxford. Um, you have to go through multiple layers of evaluation and peer review and all mm-hmm. sorts of things before the contract is finally given. Um, and, and, and then you set a deadline and numbers of words. And then it comes back with um, critiques and well, what about this and what about that? And as an author, um, you're dealing with them. Right. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll revise this. And no, I'm going to keep this the way it is. But it'll go through these various little transformations. And no one reads it after that. No one reads wow. it. So no one knows except the author, if it's keeping to 400,000 words or not. <laughs> so I took ah. advantage of that. And I, right, and I just wrote what I wrote, and it ended up being more than. But that was not a problem because it really needed to be under 800 pages. And in fact, it, it was 800 pages. I, it's sitting right beside me. And were I not too worried about being loud with turning the pages, that was going to be my check to see how many pages it was. <laughs> well, you know, if I can jump ahead, um, <clears throat> once that was finished, I actually met with Suzanne um, and her then assistant, Norm Hershey, I think his name is, who's now editor of Music Books. Um, and we were just visiting um, in in the offices in New York City, and um, she said, what's next? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, funny you should ask. <laughs> um, and I said, I think we need a book of choral scores, you know, to be, um, you know, um, accompanying right. um, you know, this, um, because there had only been the Norton and Norton one, mm-hmm. um, you know, ages before that, which I also had had a part in. And so she said, exactly my thinking, so we're going to do this. Um, And then it became 1,000 pages. Um, And that became, we can't bind together a book any larger than 1,000 pages. And she would remind me periodically, Dennis, 1,000 pages, here, 1,000 pages. Well, if you happen to have a, a book of choral scores, The final page in the book is page 1,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's just funny circumstances, the way these things turn out. It's fascinating to hear that process because it's easy to not know, quite honestly, if you've not been through the the research, writing, and, and then even the production of what it takes to publish a book, to know that and just to have a greater sense of appreciation and understanding of the process that goes into it. Yes, I do think it's interesting. Um, and I've had this conversation with some of my former students um, who have gone on to publish themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think it's been helpful to them. Um, I'd like to continue now since we're on this subject sure. um, of technology or getting back to that um, because when we started, um, well, when the Norton and Norton um, choral anthology was done, um, it was a cut and paste, literally. Huh. Um, you had scores and we cut them and pasted them and that became what was then photographed and then made into the anthology. Um, But for choral 
scores uh, with Oxford uh, now, um, Suzanne said, no, we need authentic scores. Um, and um, we can get them from various different sources. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the book and the quality that she wanted it needed to be um, consistent throughout um, in terms of its look. Sure. And so e everything sort of needed to be the same. And I assumed um, that I myself would do six or ten editions, and I would do them on either Finale or Sibelius. Mm -hmm. Um, but that didn't turn out to be the case. Um, um, we really couldn't pull from sources like CPDL, right. um, mostly because those sources weren't reliable enough. Um, and they just needed you know, more updated research. Um, and then, of course, there was the consistency um, format you know, issue. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up doing 60 of those Whoa. editions. So I had to become um, a wizard. Um, and it happened that the Sibelius works best for me. I tried Finale, but that just wasn't good. And so that book exists because of the software of mm. Finale and Sibelius, um, which prior to however many years ago couldn't have been possible because that software just was not there. Right. Yeah. So it's another great benefit of technology. Absolutely. You know, it's so fascinating, too, just thinking about the sheer technology of how music engraving has impacted us. I think about it as a performer, but to hear about it in that context um, as an academic and researcher, I, I quite honestly haven't put the dots together as to Engraving and technology techniques have really influenced that aspect of it as well, not just for a performer. Right. I mean, I, I tell students all the time, um, if you don't like an edition, make your own. Mm -hmm. It'll take you several hours, you know, to, to sit, take this a cappella, you know, Renaissance motet or madrigal um, and sit up. Then you've got, got your own edition for your own choir. Not that I don't want them to go out and buy um, editions, published editions, right. but these are ones that are more historically accurate. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing with GIA in the historical um, edition series. Yeah. Just uh, creating my own. And, by the way, um, I send them to GIA Photo Ready. Mm. So I, um, they don't have to be reset. Right, right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and I think, too, that's well, let me ask, do you think that is something we as conductors take for granted today is the fact that there are so many additions at our fingertips? Our first instinct is to not create our own, but to use one that currently exists versus that's actually been the way in which people have operated for, for thousands of years. Yes, I do think that's the general attitude, and it's mostly because there are a lot of people who don't think that they can create their own, um, even though, I don't know, how many choral conductors do you think um, are familiar and, and have the, the skills to do Finale or Sibelius? Can you estimate that? I think it's I think it's actually growing and changing, uh, rising. When I say um, changing, there are a couple even new music notation platforms out there that are even more intuitive, in my opinion, than Finale and Sibelius. So I think it's a mix. I think that is, yeah. we definitely see a rise in that, but then we also see a rise in people not notating things and just recording it as well. Yes, um, of, of course that is true. Um, and then when we talk about, um, you know, the technology, um, people don't just look at scores to learn what they may be like. Mm -hmm. They go on YouTube where they can find a recording of virtually everything. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, back to the engraving, you know, or the creating of your own editions, um, it's, it's easy. Um, the hard part 
is doing the research, mm -hmm. you know, coming up with, I'm going to put it in this key and I'm going to, um, you know, have this musica ficta, you know, or I'm going to have these, um, this meter signature, et cetera, and so forth, or text underlay. Mm -hmm. um, and once that's done, then the actual creating of the edition is easy. And then, of course, your rehearsal process <laughs> is so much more efficient because you've got a quality edition from which your singers can be singing. Right. So uh, now at this point in your career, there's no doubt to me that a certain level of this research phase just is second nature to you. But when you were starting out, what was your approach to that research process for creating your own editions? Well, I had been um, involved let me just back backtrack. Um, having very little music t musical training um, when I was growing up um, and not being in a musical environment, um, I was an outsider and I came to it with a different perspective. Music wasn't, this is the way it always is because this is the, the way we grew up with it. Mm. Um, I love that. I think that's huge. Well, it, it's, it's been beneficial for me. Um, and even at Westminster Choir College as a student, um, be, and this was in the days um, just following the death of the founder, John Finley Williamson, mm -hmm. when the sound was big and thick and heavy, um, which worked well for the big choral orchestral works, but not so well for Renaissance motets or for um, Bach, mass and, and passions um and i i knew intuitively that the way we sang the bach b minor mass which we did um was not was not right, right. <laughs> um and i even thought to myself if this music is so great why does it sound so bad um and so there was just something about i needed to find out um what this was about. Um, and so I made my first foray into um, reading primary sources. Mm -hmm. Then um, I'm teaching, at, I have graduate students mm -hmm. on the faculty at, at um, Westminster because I'm teaching Coral Lit. Um, and we're about the same age. Um, some of them are a little bit younger, some of them are a little bit older. And then I get to Oklahoma um, and I have this graduate program, every graduate student, every one of them was older than I was. Really? Yes. No, it didn't matter. Yeah. It, it just didn't matter to them. But I, I couldn't just say to them ever, this is, this is the way it is. Hmm. Um, I had to prove it. I had to have substance. So I collected primary sources. I just collected and collected and they collected. And we amassed all of these things, you know, about metric accentuation and ornamentation and phrasing and articulation um, from Renaissance sources, you know, all the way through. And a number of these students did their dissertations mm -hmm. um, on these subjects. Um, and so that's how I was able to then do further research. Right. Uh, oh, no, that's how I was able to facilitate the making of additions yeah. um, because I could go back to the primary sources. Well, this is what they say in terms of musica ficta and musica recta, and so this is what, we, this is what we'll do. I think I, I love that. I mean, I think that is a story more people need to hear and really embrace is that it, it seems to me you you were not an island, right? You recognized the knowledge and skills and passion of, in this case, your students, but also as a colleagues. And it was, um, you know, an, an interesting working together symbiosis that enabled you to do even more than if you were acting all of this on your own. Absolutely. I've always, always had the mentality, the attitude, <clears throat> surround me by the most talented people possible, and we'll all grow together. Um, and that was the environment, um, always. And 
still became, it still is the environment. I just love to be surrounded by people who are brighter than I am, who are more talented than I am, um, and who can teach me things. Um, not underplaying that I have a role too, and there's a certain amount of talent and information I have, and together um, we then can further everybody's skill level, knowledge set, um, and so forth. Absolutely. That's very much so how I feel on, on this call, actually speaking with you. I, I feel so um, just honored uh, within that. It, before we circle back to technology again, you know, I would love to hear a bit more about how then you came to music, not having grown up in a musical household and then accelerated so quickly to be teaching at Westminster after graduation and to be younger than your graduate students at Oklahoma. Okay, yeah, so this is another um, very um, poignant and, and kind of gripping experience. So I graduated, um, I, I went to a, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, and went to a public school that happened to be in this very um, academically um, oriented um, community, it's called Squirrel Hill, and the high school even though public school, it was um, high academic standing, so forth, and just, you know, took all the academic things, um, but um, managed um, for one year to sing in the choir, um, mostly because I wanted to avoid doing something else. Um, and um, I loved it, um, and there was one day we were singing the foray requiem and it was the unused day mm -hmm. of that and the conductor who was also very young just had just graduated from carnegie tech then it's carnegie mellon university now and um he ruminated um after you know we had sung the unused day and he he said um isn't that just about the most beautiful thing you've ever heard? And I thought to myself, hmm, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is. Um, and so I was smitten, you know, then. But then I went to, I graduated high school in January, um, and I went to um, this little school in Pennsylvania called Indiana University of Pennsylvania, <laughs> IUP. Yeah, it's um, in a little town called Indiana, Pennsylvania. Um, and thinking about, you know, is it going to be music or architecture? You know, I don't know, but I, I, I sang in the Glee Club, and I took this theory course um, with this um, very um, um, unique faculty member. <laughs> by the name of Alan Trubit. Um, and I, I thought it was just great fun. Um, and I just did this and did that and whatever. And I, I kind of had the experience, the thought that I don't think I'm doing exactly what everybody else in the class is doing, but, but I was young. I mean, very young. Mm -hmm. So I, I did that. And then one day um, I heard from somebody that he was leaving. And so I went to his studio and I said, Dr. Trubit, is it true that you're leaving? And he said, yes, and you are too. <laughs> and he, um, he helped me um, fill out applications and guided me to audition at Curtis, Oberlin, and Westminster Choir College. Um, and I, I ended up at Westminster Choir College um, as... Um, as a music major, um, because he had faith in me, and um, there I was. Now, I, I, I should say that um, I came, I transferred to Westminster, obviously, so I was a transfer student, mm -hmm. and I was there with some other transfer students, um, and they went and you know took the theory placement test. They were older than I was, and they took um, both the freshman level and the sophomore level. And I didn't want to be by myself, so I took both mm -hmm. of them, too. I passed them all. Wow. Um, 
And so they put me in junior counterpoint, having previously only had one semester of theory. So I went back to communicate with Dr. Trubit, mm -hmm. and I said, no, I, I was saying, Congrat congratulations, you know, look, look, what, look what I was able to do. Yeah. And he said, well, of course, because, you know, you, you didn't follow the regular um, syllabus of the class. I just took you as far as I could take you. Wow. Um, yeah, right. So I benefited from that. And so there was a sense that, um, well, as that student at Westminster Choir College, then word got out fast. Mm -hmm. um, here's this, you know, kid who can, who can do this, that, and and oh, by the way, he can sight read. Um, and in fact, um, my organ teacher said right away, "Do you have a church job?" And I said, "No." And he said, "Well, come and sing for me." <laughs> And so he was um, music director at Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City. Um, and so I, I went in and sang there. Um, oh. And by the way, since we're going down memory lane here, um, some of the, I, w I would always stay on Sundays, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes in having lunch with um, Dr. Markey was his name, George Markey, and his family, his wife and kids. Um, but then I got to know some of the choir members, and there was a group of them who lived in the village. And so, you know, come down, you know, spend the afternoon with us in the village. So, yeah, sure. Um, well, we have some, we have some composers' friends <sighs> who you should meet, and 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 who would like to meet you too. Oh, that'd be great. And so, you know, went down there and and met his composer friends, the friends being Samuel Barber <laughs> and John Colomanati and um, Aaron Copeland. <laughs> and we would just spend the afternoon together talking about this, talking about that. Um, yeah, so I was fortunate, very, very fortunate um, in the people who supported me um, and in the experiences um i've had with people and with repertoire did you realize at that time as you were sitting you know in the same room as these greats who you were with and what that would mean no nope. i did not at all yeah which in some ways is probably the even bigger beauty of it well i mean they were young too right. at this point um so I guess this was in the sixties. Um, I, I guess. Um, so, I mean, I mean, Barbara was, you know, just writing Anthony and Cleopatra. And I remember he was thinking about, um, making choral arrangements of his songs, like sure in the shining night mm -hmm. and, um, the monk and his cat. Um, so I remember him talking about that. Um, and I remember him talking about the dilemma of people want me to make a choral version of the adagio for strings. Mm. Um, I don't know what text I can use. So I'm thinking about what that text might be. So I remember him you know, going, you know, talking about things like that. Wow. Uh, you know, yeah, it, it's interesting now looking back on it, of course, um, because these are you know, iconic works um, um, that, you know, I was involved tangentially, but nevertheless um, involved in their, you know, their initial creation. Well, and I, I think the other facet of this, which is so special, is you continue to be involved in in the experience that so many people have with these works in your writing and research in and of the works themselves, but also the works that precede them that lead many people to discover and appreciate the beauty of them as well. Yes. I mean, ab absolutely. I am ab devoted to that. Sure. I love that. I love, thank you for sharing that story with us. I think, um, that's just so, that's so special. Um, so, and then kind of turning us even more back to technology and, and, and then how that, how have you really begin to see that as, um, 
as we enter this new phase, right, we mentioned recording and that a lot of people will record things. Uh, I, I would love your thoughts on this and its, its place and role in choral repertoire. Yes, well, you know, um, I, I knew, no, Eric Whitaker, so I, I knew that he was um, you know, creating this virtual choir, mm-hmm. um, and I was, you know, thought it was a fascinating new um, manner of communication, um, and, and I embraced it. I mean, I, I think it's wonderful because of the numbers of people it reaches, mm-hmm. um, the number of people that it brings choral music to. Um, And um, then now, right now, during this um, coronavirus, um, oh, there's some sort of amber alert, I guess. Can you hear that buzzing? Uh, Very faintly. It's not bad at all. Okay, good. Um, So um, right now, um, there are church musicians, um, a number of my friends, who are creating virtual choirs because they cannot meet for services. Right. And they're doing it specifically right now for Easter coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they have to use technology in order to communicate um, in a choral sense with um with their congregants, right. um, yeah, their, their congregations. So they're doing that. Um, one of my former students, um, Nate Zulinger, who teaches at Haverford College, um, has had me send him Sibelius files, and then he is then forwarding them to his students um, along with scores so that they can study choral literature you know, mm. and, and hear the music. And then a couple of my students, I just realized, are doing their own little YouTube things through Facebook, I guess. So um, one, Jonathan Hatley, is recording him playing the piano with ornamentation and um, tempos, so forth, based upon primary sources. And it's just get, getting quite a following. Um, that um, because he's homebound he can't teach um, and and wants to reach his students and other people so he's using this format in order to doing that so um, dreadful um, as this virus is to um, to the world um it has created some very, very unique possibilities and opportunities in terms of technology um, for music. Right. Don't you think? I, I definitely do. And, you know, it's especially in the choral world, it's been an interesting debate to watch people say, uh, discuss the merits as to whether or not virtual choir is real choir or not, to which my, my thinking is, you know, technology has always been innovating within um, – everywhere but especially within choral music you know at what point do you say that choir is not choir is then a recording of any choir is that real choir music does choir music only have to exist as people singing it together at the same time in the same place i don't think so um but i you know well well, when you think that the virtual choir is created by people singing right then it's people singing. <laughs> so it's, you know, there's that aspect of realism to it. Um, it's just another form. Right. And like you, you know, I'd say we have to move forward. Um, it, it's here. You know, let's take advantage of what it can do for us. And right now, during this virus cri- crisis, we have to. Um, you know, it's, it's basically our only manner of communication. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, bravo, technology. Now, the fact that I am not on Facebook nor on any other social media um, doesn't mean that I don't embrace technology. Right. I do. It's just that um, I want uh, to preserve some degree of a private life. Sure. 
Um, and I, I, I look for ways to get away from the computer, not to spend more time at it. I love that. And I, I do hope that this that has been the case for a lot of people as well as to uh, find some sort of simplicity from behind the the front of their screens during this time as well. And and maybe, you know, it's been exciting to see more people sitting behind their uh, their pianos or their instruments or, or just singing and making gen- music in general. Um, I, I feel like there's been a real resurgence in that. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I, we're kind of wrapping up here. I could talk to you for hours, but <laughs> while I do have um, the leading expert in in choral repertoire, um, you know, I I was not really raised. Um, I was not raised with a super rich. Um, understanding of choir music. I, I grew up singing um, in church, but it was more from behind a hymnal and then a little contemporary Christian music. Um, in fact, growing up, I didn't realize that the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir were two different things, <laughs> right? To which they are very uh, different, as you know, being in the New York City area. Yes. Um, but I'm, I'm curious as to if you were to walk us through the basics of the history of choral music. I know that is the biggest task ever, but what could you say to give, to whet someone's appetite about each of the, the main eras? Well, okay. I'll give it a try okay. because you asked, not because I like it. I know, I know. Because or- you asked. Or, or even, but I, I think this is a really cool thing for people to realize because if they were like me, before I went to my graduate program, before I was introduced to your music and your work, I didn't fully understand the breadth of our history. And I, and I find that that is a common thing for people that have not been able to go and, and do a secondary graduate study in this art form. And, and that's, that's only why I ask. Yeah, okay, so fine. Um, I'll preface it by saying um, that the novice, you know, the, the, the person getting started in this, um, should focus on repertoire that's interesting. And I say that um, because um, I, I think it needs to um, generate a spark um, that will want you to come back to it, and, and much of the music won't. Um, this Dr. Trubit at Indiana University of Pennsylvania did give me some listening things to do. Um, and one of them was a, a Brahms piano concerto. Um, and you no, know, I fell asleep listening to it. And I, I said, I, I just, I went back to when I said, I, you know, I just can't find, you know, anything to sustain, you know, my interest in this. And he said, okay, but mark my words, one day you will consider this to be great. I said, oh, okay, fine. Um, and sure enough, you know, the Brahms piano concertos are great masterworks, um, but not then. Um, and so in my teaching, I, I always wanted um, there to be a you know, spark of interest, um, even in my programming. You know, I do that. I want it to be interesting to the audience. And then the other day, um, one of my former students, Jim Moyer, who mm-hmm. teaches in Pensbury, Pennsylvania, um, has a son who is at Westminster Choir College, but the of their, of course, home because right. you know, nobody's in classes now. And he said, Dennis, can you um, can you give James, his son's name James, um, can you give him a listening list mm. of things that you know he might you know listen to, um, you know, while he's know homebound um and i I said sure um he he has expressed an interest in renaissance music which i think is quite interesting um and so i i compiled um a a list um of pieces not just from the renaissance but from other eras too that i thought he might find interesting um and first i went to my recordings um, that are, I did five of them with the Santa Fe Desert Chorale and, and, and one since then um, to, on Renaissance Music. Um, and they're all on my website, every track of every recording. So I said, you can go there. Why don't you listen to tracks da, 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 of this 
th that and so forth. Um, and I picked um, things not like a Palestrina motet, um, but of um, Wilkes when David heard, hmm. or something that had a more immediacy of, oh, listen to how this this cross relation or whatever, you know, how dramatic, you know, it happens to be. Um, so in answer to your question, first, in the medieval era, um, I would um, guide people to the works of Johannes Ciconia, mm -hmm. um, because they are fascinating, interesting, and they're, they're hocket, uh -huh. um, and in some of the other things. I think hardly anybody could not be fascinated by this music. So it can, it can be a foothold or an entry into the medieval era. Um, and for the Renaissance era, you know, it might be Dowland lute songs, you know, which are you know, relatively accessible. Jesualdo madrigals, mm -hmm. who, who, who can't be fascinated by <laughs> all that chromaticism, you know, and, and wild harmonic motion. And or epic works like um, the Talus Feminalium, the 40-part yes. motet, or um, something like, um, it was just in my mind, and it went away, um, the Allegri Miserere, yes. um, with all those high Cs. Um, that you know, could be an interesting entry um, into the Renaissance era. For the Baroque era, it would not be the B minor Mass or the St. Matthew Passion or the St. John Passion. It would be Zinget dem Herrn mm -hmm. of Bach um, because, you know, of the, the incredible virtuosity of all of those melismatic lines. And it wouldn't be Handel Messiah. It would be Handel Israel and Egypt because when you're listening to all those plague choruses, mm -hmm. you know, the jumping of the frogs and the, the hail and so forth, um, that, that becomes fascinating, yeah. interesting. And I think that the chorus, the horse and his rider, um, yeah. that ends part two, is just so thrilling. Um, you know, one can hardly keep one's seat. Um, and so for the classical era, then, you know, it becomes Haydn creation, um, which has so many colorful choruses. Um, and from the Romantic era, golly, um, the, the Berlioz damnation of Faust, again, it's colorful. So that would be my recommendation. Go for something that is particularly fascinating or interesting, um, and then that'll take you somewhere else. Well, if Handel wrote this here, then what else did he write You know that, that I might like? Right. And then it's like looking in an encyclopedia, you're at, or even on the Internet, you're here, and then it takes you to there, and that takes you to someplace else, and that takes you to someplace else. And then several hours later, you've been to somewhere where you never thought you'd ever be. It's the beauty of research, isn't it? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, hearing you talk about all of this, I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask a very, very selfish question, and that is my graduate research thesis uh, was on Carissimi's Jonas. Oh, I love it. Talk about fascinating. Right? Yes, the storm scene is yeah. just wonderful. It's just so, so exciting and so dramatic and so colorful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, what are your thoughts? I would just kind of even love your, I mean, again, an, another broad topic, but I, I thrive on seeing kind of where you go with it, this topic of, of musical rhetoric. Well, I mean, that's what we've been talking about. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, so a absolutely. It's just it's just another way of expressing, you know, the, the finding of the expressiveness or the finding of the dr drama or the finding of the, the com you know, the, the manners of communication through the music. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think so. Um, Nicholas Harnoncourt, mm -hmm. um, as you may know, has written a book on musical rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and talks about that. Um, but, you know, back to um, the Carissimi Jonas, that final chorus mm. um, is every bit as glorious, maybe more so, 
than the final chorus of Yepta. I agree. Um, I agree. Right. But everybody knows the final chorus, Plorate Filii. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. Um, but nobody really, or few people know um, the final chorus of Jonas. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it oh. that one is just it's it's so it's one of those that I can't figure out why uh, Yepta is is much more popular than Jonas. Well, who knows? I mean, why is why is Messiah as popular as it is? I mean, you just you can't necessarily figure these things out. Mm -hmm. um, but what we can do is um, expand the universe of enjoyable music. Um, and that's what my mission is, and that's what your mission is now, too, especially through your blogs. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just so, so grateful again to, to have you on here. Um, and, you know, what, what are you keeping your eyes on for the future within choral music repertoire? Well, um, you know, it's, it's from project to project. Um, I, you know, this new new book on um, creating excellence um, um, is basically organized into several or, or a number of theoretical concepts um, and then a number of practical applications. Mm -hmm. So um, the theoretical might be goals or focus and attitudes and procedures um, and the practical applications, you know, sound and blend, cohesion and expression, conducting um, repertoire. Um, and um, Alec Harris of GIA really likes it um, because of its um, accessibility you know, to the world out there, um, right. choirs and orchestras. But um, you should know that there will be a second edition of Choral Repertoire. Really? Okay. Yeah, right. Um, and it will likely include about 50 more composers. Wow. Um, and um, these composers, not specifically, but there will be more women composers mm -hmm. and there will be more composers of color. So you're asking me about the future. So I'm saying that I think the future needs to be more inclusive. Yeah. Um, and those of us, you know, who have an, an opportunity to, to do this um, are doing it. Now, of course, this comes from Suzanne Ryan of Oxford University Press, who says if we're going to do this, Dennis, we need to, you know, to do this. Um, so there's that. Uh, but there's also an, an updating of research information because it's just going at lightning speed. Mm -hmm. So um, there are more things I know now um, than I did 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the future is in the, a, a broadening of um, broadening of repertoire um, and, and it's more world repertoire, mm -hmm. not necessarily folk repertoire as world music was, um, you know, however many decades ago, um, but just music from around the world, <laughs> um, in, including from places like Iceland um, and, of course, Estonia, mm. uh, and not just, you know, the, the, the Eurocentric um, countries. Um, but then um, more research into historical performance um, as um, the world spends millions of dollars restoring artworks and and architecture um, we need to spend um, time and effort and money restoring musical works so that the world can experience the works in the manner in which they were intended. So I think that's incumbent upon um, the younger generation to embrace this um, more and more. Well, Dr. Schrock, I, I know that you entered college with plans to do music or architecture, and I, I have to say, I think you've successfully done both. 
<laughs> because what well, you have built for us um, is not been out of you know, man-made uh, building materials of the sense, but um, you have built so many frameworks and points of entry and accessibility for us to, to do exactly what you are asking for us to do in the future. Well, thank you. And to use your words, I love that. <laughs> I really do. That's, that's, that's very gracious of you and, um, and very heartwarming. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you again. And I'll be sure to include links to these and, and your bio and your books and all of that in the future, as well as be sharing with listeners when your new book releases will be out. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you again. And very good luck to you in all your endeavors. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to another episode of the Choir Baton Podcast. I'm your host, Beth Philemon, and this episode has been produced by Maggie Hemmedinger. You can follow Choir Baton on Instagram. That's where we hang out the most, both myself and then the various takeovers that we host as well. Make sure you are signed up for our Choir Baton email that we send out once a week filled with all kinds of information inspiration and insight in and about choir and finally know that choir baton exists to encourage you and to reignite a passion for choir within your heart and mind and soul especially during this time and if it has done that for you we know it will do that for others so please consider sharing this with a colleague whether they are a fellow singer teacher, conductor, composer, anyone within the field or anyone that's just interested in choir and thinks needs to hear this message at this time, please consider sharing this episode of the Choir Baton podcast with them. Thank you so much for listening and let's get more people singing.